Welcome to our session here on planning and zoning for all sizes of solar. Uh, my name is David Levy. I chair the energy practice at the Barrett Home Law Firm in Omaha, and I get to be the moderator today. Um, I'm going to keep my role very brief. I actually do not have biographical information for these gentlemen, so they even get to introduce themselves, uh, and then which they can do better than I could do, of course. Uh, and then you can hear from each of them. Um, but briefly, uh, as I mentioned, the title of the panel is, is for all sizes of solar. Uh, we have Mike Shanka here who's going to talk about residential solar, uh, Cliff Mesner who's going to talk about community solar, uh, and Colin Snow who's going to talk about utility scale solar. We were just having a conversation upstairs, uh, and I think over time the difference between residential solar, community solar, and utility scale solar uh, probably will come, become blurrier and the, the distance in between those will fill in with all kinds of different projects. I think one of the great things about solar uh, energy is the business models are as many as we could sit here all afternoon and think of. So it, it's a lot of fun. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Mike. Take it away. Whoops. Uh, so thanks so much for coming out. My name is Colin Snow. I'm a development manager with Ranger Power. Um, Ranger Power, just to uh, cover briefly and introduce ourselves, we are a utility-scale solar developer. Uh, we specialize in utility-scale projects. Well, really wants to go ahead. Um, we are uh, developing a portfolio of over 20 projects across seven states in the Midwest. Um, we have over 1,500 megawatts of successfully permitted uh, large-scale solar projects uh, across that portfolio. Um, I'm here today uh, kind of talking specifically about uh, the permitting process uh, of our Salt Creek Solar Project, which is located kind of northeast of Lincoln within the uh, city's uh, ETJ. Um, okay, well, that was a nice wipe. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so Salt Creek itself um, uh, is a uh, fully permitted 230 megawatt solar project located on over 1,000 acres of uh, privately owned land in East Lincoln. Uh, the reason that the project is where it is really ties into something that somebody else brought up, another developer, which is uh, the existing infrastructure. So, <laughs> uh, sorry, I saw people laughing. Uh, it's really moving me along here fast. Uh, so, um, the Wagoner substation, our interconnection at the Wagoner substation there, which you can see here. The Wagoner substation, which you may be able to see on the, on the map soon, is really what brought us, brought us to the site that we have uh, now uh, fully permitted. Um, you can see it there in the middle. Uh, the point there being that, uh, as with all of our projects in our entire portfolio, we are looking for existing infrastructure that can handle the size of the projects that we want to uh, build there. Um, so that's what brought us to East Lincoln here, uh, that and um, the interested landowners uh, in the area around it. Um, well, I guess I better move along. <laughs> uh, one of the major reasons that we the project brought the project to started developing the project uh, <laughs> where it is uh, is because of the positive permitting environment that uh, Lincoln um, ha has established uh, in advance of us even coming. Um, what I have here are kind of general rules that we look for um, and that we feel encourage at a local level. Uh, responsible solar development, utility scale solar development. So just really quickly, um, you know, a general comprehensive plan here, this is the, uh, we're talking about the uh, Lincoln's Municipal Code that expressly promotes the responsible development of large scale uh, solar. Um, uh, I'd like to kind of move on to uh, Lincoln also has a very simple and clear and prescriptive ordinance, solar ordinance um, that again, uh, does hark back to their comprehensive plan and create a united uh, infrastructure under which to develop uh, large-scale solar. Um, one of the major uh, elements that we look for in permitting any project of any size is avoiding any kind of rezoning of land. So we view these projects as an ag use, um, and we uh, work almost entirely in communities that view it as the same. So uh, the idea being that we build a solar project of the kind that we want to build, and when the project is done, uh, it can be removed, and the uh, ground has lain fallow for that time and can be returned to farming purposes, ag purposes. Very important to keep it uh, zoned ag. Um, 
you know, implicit in our kind of permit and, and um, uh, you know, something I'm going to talk about in a second, our community work, is establishing sort of how uh, the project should fit into the community that um, is welcoming it. These projects are designed to be around for a, a while, and so you want it to fit into the uh, neighborhood in a way that makes the neighbors, um, you know, comfortable, happy, um, you know, appreciative of it. A big part of that is working uh, with uh, setbacks, and, and uh, vegetative buffering, uh, other types of visual buffering. Uh, the, one of the advantages to solar, even though you may be making a large scale project, 230 megawatts, uh, there is uh, an ability to kind of move the way it presents visually um, you know, uh, on the footprint and uh, presents a lot of advantages to um, working with the neighbors and the community. Um, th the last thing I really do want to hit on is this last bullet actually. Um, Lincoln is a very sophisticated, has a very sophisticated planning staff, um, is a very sophisticated uh, city government, and this presented a great strength for development and for responsible development. They know what they are doing, they know what they want, they're interested in fact-based findings. This uh, matters a great deal uh, in any sort of permitting pursuit. So I do need to say that this is, uh, Lincoln uh, has presented a great uh, environment for the development of utility-scale solar. Um, but as a general rule, the, the more kind of science-based and fact-based that your uh, kind of county infrastructure or city infrastructure, wherever you're developing is, uh, generally the, the better it will be for the development of a project of, of the size of the ones that we develop. Uh, so um, one of the most important um, uh, elements of the Ranger Power philosophy throughout our entire portfolio is uh, the it really intense work we do with the community in advance of any permitting push. Uh, so what that meant for Salt Creek specifically was that we opened an office in Eagle, Nebraska uh, since last December. Whoa. Uh, oh, sorry, we're, we're both. <laughs> uh, uh, since last December, um, we've engaged in over 40 sit-down meetings, this over 100 telephone calls, and just a huge amount of work, mainly uh, you know, educating the neighbors on uh, what the project actually entails, how it will fit in with uh, the community as it exists, and then really hearing their questions and concerns. Um, these proved extremely fruitful. We were able to bake most of uh, kind of the information we learned from those conversations into uh, and in advance of our special permit application. Um, and so um, we were able to host a um, very well attended uh, open house in, also in advance of submitting uh, the special permit, which again contributed to kind of getting the right feedback we needed so we could go before the planning commission and then the city council and gain the uh, unanimous approval of both counts that we were seeking. Um, I'm happy to report we did receive over 140 letters of support for the project from Lincoln and Lancaster County community, uh, which you know we're really proud of. And um, as I said, this project, are you know, uh, going to be a long-standing member of the community, and we continue to re receive letters of support, and are really excited to uh, be here. Um, okay, great. Um, I think I jumped ahead of the one last point. Uh, all of this work uh, that I've discussed, and the kind of um, synergy of you know our community work and uh, Lincoln's. Um, pro-renewable, pro-utility scale solar uh, environment did allow us to uh, receive a, uh, um, our special permit was approved uh, by the city council on uh, September 30th unanimously, which was really, really exciting and we really look forward to uh, continuing our work here. Thanks very much. Well, my name is Cliff Messner. Um, my wife and I are the owners of Messner Development Company in Central City. Uh, we are lawyers by education, but uh, real estate developers by trade. Uh, we've spent most of the last 25 years developing real estate uh, across uh, Nebraska and Kansas, and our solar interest, in, in a way, has become an outgrowth of that real estate. So when you talk about planning and zoning, uh, I start from a real estate perspective, not from a solar perspective. Um, and um, that's kind of how we got to the community solar uh, arrangement. Uh, it actually started when I was trying to get Michael Shanka to uh, come out and put 100 solar panels on my roof, and he said they're not all going to fit, so we had to put them someplace else, and that started the concept of, 
of community solar. Since then, uh, we've been doing some, a lot of work. We have formed N Solar with uh, GenPro Energy Solutions and uh, Soul Systems. Uh, we've done about uh, 20 projects across the state, and about half of those are some form, or most of those actually, are some form of community solar. The concept behind community solar is to really avoid the, the uh, zoning issues. Um, that's why we started doing it in the first place. Um, are you going to run them or do you want me to? Um, to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, net metering is allowed under state law, but net metering assumes that the solar is going to be physically attached to the property. Uh, virtual net metering is what community solar uses, and it's based on the concept that the property is not physically attached to the property. Um, it's actually based on the concept that you find the solar and put it in the appropriate location. So rather than trying to zone around it, you just simply move it to where it needs to be. Real estate and solar are now starting, the solar is showing up in real estate on two sides. Uh, one side is uh, what it looks like, the street appeal of having solar up on a rooftop. And that's what people are used to saying. As real estate developers, we're starting to see the flip side of that. We're starting to see people that say, I only want a house that will accept solar. Um, they want to know whether or not they have solar. They want to know whether or not they can put an a, uh, electric car in their garage and charge it with solar. Um, so suddenly, housing that doesn't have solar capacity is less valuable. And that's been an interesting twist that we've seen in the last few years. Um, this is. Uh, a, a picture I took of, a, of, or I didn't take, this is actually a picture I found. Two houses, those are the same floor plan, uh, the same solar on the top. Those are higher end homes. From a real estate perspective, I don't think that looks real good. Uh, I think that that kind of detracts from the, from the appearance of that home and it's not good for the street appeal. But if you can put solar on your rooftop and save you $300 a month, people are going to do it. So what's happening is um, communities are starting to try and find ways to, re to react to this and how to deal with it. Um, and the, the reality is that we've learned that consumers will choose um, an alternative if it's available to them. They'll choose community solar if you give it to them because they don't have to change the appearance of the house. They don't have to have a south-facing location. It's not in the way when they re-shingle. It's completely portable. It means you can sell your house without selling your solar. You can sell your solar without selling your house. Uh, the consumers don't have to buy, don't have to each go out and hire an installer. Uh, some programs don't even require an initial investment. Uh, if you want to buy solar in uh, an MPPD retail town that's using the Sunwise program or in Fremont or Hastings, you can go in and buy shares. You don't have to make an initial investment into that uh, property. Uh, those individuals don't have to maintain it, and it's insured through the system. There's just lots of reasons why people would go to a community solar instead of rooftop solar. The problem is we've got a city versus utility issue out there because zoning policies are made by the city and solar policies are set by the utility. Um, and they don't always share the same perspective and don't often come to the same conclusion. It's the cities who are saying, let's do community solar, let's push the solar out there so we don't have to hear about it at city council meeting, whether or not uh, that solar is ugly or whether or not the shade trees are in the way or whether or not uh, the kid playing ball is going to hurt the solar. But it sometimes becomes a conflict. Now, I'll show an example here. We did two low-income housing tax credit projects with uh, solar uh, two years ago. And one of them, we had this. Uh, the project was designed, was ready to go, and we went out and put solar on the rooftop as best we could. Uh, we kind of pushed it around the, uh, the vents and what was there. The other one, we went to Holdridge, which was a, a wholesale town. So the utility and the, um, and the city are the same. And I said, gosh, you know, it looks kind of ugly when we put it up on the rooftop. So this is the Holdridge project because I went to the Holdridge city administrator and said, I don't want to put it in the rooftop. So he said, 
He put me in his car, literally drove me out to the substation and said, can you put it here? So we put it on the old landfill by the substation. Now, is this ugly? Yes. Does anybody care? No. And what we've done with community solar is we've taken the zoning issue out of the mix. We've simply moved the zoning or the, the solar to a spot that's appropriate for it. A substation out in the country is a, is a nice spot. Um, the last point I want to make is uh, the issues with economies of scale and, and how that's helped us out with community solar. If you hire Genpro or Mike to put something on their rooftop, they're going to charge you about twice as much as they're going to charge you to put that in a community solar system. So what we've learned is that by going out and building a community solar system, we can cut the cost in half. And what happens with that extra money is that is used to go back to public power because we're asking public power to um, maintain the system. We're asking public power to be the battery, to be the backup, and we need to keep public power alive. That's what end solar is. Our byline is integrating solar with public power. And we can do that through community solar. The consumer gets the same thing that he's going to get anyway because we've cut the price in half. And the additional money helps maintain the system uh, for public power and keep public power whole. And that is my presentation. Um, my name is Michael Shanka, and I do uh, deal with various types of solar, but the one I was asked to focus on is uh, commercial agricultural and, and residential. That's kind of an exciting area. So just overall, I was going to talk about some of the code issues, uh, what's our bottom line here, and then kind of go through our workflow best practices. And I did a presentation on this yesterday, so some of you will see the same slides. This is the code will, for those of you that not are familiar with it, AHJ is the authority having jurisdiction, and those are the people like your local code inspector, building inspector, electrical inspector, plumbing inspector, whatever it might be. But each one of these little acronyms around the outside of the wheel is a code book, and it's a body of, of knowledge. And if you stacked them from the floor, it'd be past the ceiling. But the amount of pages that affect solar are just less than half an inch thick. There's just not that many pages of it altogether. Most importantly is the National Electric Code. Article 690 is the part where solar's in. And uh, every three years, this gets revised. Uh, less important is the IRC. And the fire code actually is kind of interesting now. They make us have boundaries around uh, the solar installations on residential and commercial jobs where we didn't have to worry about that in, in the past. Uh, International Building Code is the other one. Oh, it did it to me. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the other one that's um, important. So really what it gets down to, the bottom line, I like to just say it's, it's all about safety and meeting these standards that are expressed in these various code books and, and uh, jurisdictional bodies. Uh, the, the overall importance, though, is we, we've got to keep in mind just common sense, keeping the cost low, the longevity of the installation. You want it to be around for the next generation and uh, meet your customer expectations. So safety, of course, is primary, what everybody here is talking about one way or another. So I took a workflow approach to this to help people understand if you're, you know, know a lot about solar, you get this right away. If you don't know too much about solar, then you'll, you'll kind of go through these steps as a, a simple way to understand the process and how it works. And so you're going to start with really site selection. Uh, you, you've got to find a sunny spot, and it's got to be something either a roof or a ground mount area. Then you're going to start through a, an equipment design, which I, it's really a series of iterations from equipment uh, th that you look at with modules or it might be inverters, and then how that fits in the spot that you want to do it. Once you've got the preliminaries figured out, then you go to your friendly power company and you fill out their form if they have one and talk to them about how to interconnect with them, and that's the important criteria there. Uh, so the rest of it's just kind of the other parts that go together with the system as far as uh, how you mount the system, what kind of rack you select, and where you put the inverter. Hopefully it's in a shady spot. Uh, although importance to your local utility is going to be that you have an outside AC disconnect. That's something you don't want to forget. So 
When you do your wire route from your rack back to where the inverter is to where you connect either at the meter or in the, in the service panel, you got to have an outside disconnect uh, on the AC side of the inverter. Um, lastly, commissioning is something we used to just sort of take for granted. Now there's a whole procedure behind it, especially when you get to larger scale systems, it's very important to go through all that last minute punch list to make sure everything's working properly before you hand it over. So on site selection, uh, essentially that's it. It's, it's covering a sunny spot, and you want to choose them between microinverters, optimizers, strings. Why is that important? Well, it's going to make your system work well. And when you put something in at the very beginning of a 20-year of a system, it'll add up to megawatts of power if it's done correctly versus not having uh, the economic advantage uh, that you would with a well-designed system. Uh, so the equipment selection, again, there's a lot of different types, and I call it the solar coaster for a reason. It's not just my title, but the model changes that solar modules go through is very prolific, and the, the model may only be around for a few months, uh, but the next ones will come along, may be improved, or they might be very, very similar. Uh, but you like to get uh, equipment that's all uh, harmonizes and works well uh, together. It's very important. Probably the, one of the most important things for the people here that are involved with city government is going to be this whole permit application process. And, and that you want to just keep simple. You keep it simple to encourage compliance, and you want to try to make sure that you work with the contractors and the people that are inter investing in this so that uh, you meet their goals also. But again, safety being the important one, uh, you try to keep this uh, a, a quick and simple, a quick turnaround, and uh, doesn't mean you have to compromise anything, it just means that uh, you want to be efficient in how it works. Um, I'll skip over some of these slides because they're are really more detail-oriented. One that's probably important that a lot of people don't realize is you do need these boundaries around a solar system on a rooftop, so you try to stay two to three feet at least from the edges. Uh, because that's where your wind loads are your greatest, and that just makes sense to look at it. Uh, this was the first system that was installed on a center pivot in the state out by Lindsay, Nebraska, and you can't really see it from here, but there's uh, actually a windbreak about two miles out that direction. <laughs> you know, really what happens, Nebraska's famous for a lot of wind, right? I mean, we have... Uh, this issue also works against us on solar systems, and this is a 100-foot long rack where it was spaced apart in the middle. It was broken up into smaller racks so that the air could get around it. And they've had sustained 80-mile-an-hour winds in that area since it's been installed, uh, but you just want it to last for a long time. Uh, some systems were installed early on are actually quite ugly. Uh, we don't do this kind of uh, work anymore. It's uh, more aesthetics is in mind, and that's important. And of course, solar electric is different than the predecessor of thermal systems, and so they're going to be closer to the roof and actually just much more attractive. Uh, as an example of a system uh, that actually made it to an ASHRAE publication where the homeowner installed it himself and did a very good job. Uh, system in Lincoln here at 27th and Holdridge, where the only place we could really put it was in the middle of the roof area, and it worked out fairly well to be somewhat inconspicuous there, actually. Um, changes in code practices happen uh, periodically every three years. The new code book comes along for electrical, and so how this one went in before, now the wires going down to the inverter would be encased in a PVC conduit. They haven't before. Uh, some updates were important. Uh, here you can see, oh, oh gosh, it's really going on me. Come on, just there. And so this one here, uh, this is a collar that goes over the meter box. So now we can take the solar and put it right into the meter box for residential. And uh, that's a really great application. You don't have to go into the house, and so it's, it's a lot less um, expensive for the homeowner. Uh, I'll skip over some of these slides, too. Just to be said that a wire management is an important criteria. Also, when you're looking at service panels, the electrical inspector a lot of times 
uh, will insist on, for example, putting the breakers in the bottom for solar. Uh, that's important uh, because of the way uh, the energy flows through the panel. So what we're looking at, things on the horizon, I think is important to consider also and how we're going to adapt as a state, not just considering these codes, but our own communities. So I did provide some references here towards the end of this. If you download the, the file, you'll see a number of these reports are readily available online and serve for good models for uh, code development for communities. So there we go. Um, thank you. So we do have, I think, about 15 minutes left for Q&A. Does anybody have questions for these guys? You know, what, what should county officials uh, who are creating zoning ordinances uh, or zoning around utilities, large-scale utility uh, scale solar uh, be thinking about? Is that really what you're, yeah. Um, uh, you know, as always, it's good to kind of look at places that have you know, the codes that have uh, kind of encouraged or, you know, have created, um, you know, an environment that has been positive for this, the development or, you know, have created the projects that you think do fit in with the community at large. Um, there will always be sort of, uh, you know, every community is different and there will always be sort of an individual nature probably to um, any kind of ordinance or zoning. But uh, the, the more that the guidelines are kind of simple clear, um, create a really nice balance between property um, uh, rights, you know, a person's right to do what, what they want with their land, uh, while also safeguarding the nature of the uh, area around. The more you kind of have those ideals in, in, the, in your head, uh, I think generally speaking, the better uh, the permitting process will come and the ordinance, uh, you know, will, will come out. Um, and so, you know, the Lincoln City Ordinance is a good example of, of I, I think, that. I'd add to that. We had the pleasure of working with Colin and Ranger on the Salt Creek project, and he, he, everything he said about the city of Lincoln and their ordinance and, and their staff is, is right. One of the things that I thought was interesting in that process, though, is you go and, and the zoning regulations have setbacks. Most zoning regulations do. And a solar project's going to have setbacks. But the zoning regulations, like many do, were, were basically written for a residential, a single-family home kind of application. So they had a front yard setback that was one number. They had side yard setbacks that were another number and rear yard setbacks that were another number. A solar project doesn't really have a front, a side, or a rear. So we, we were able to work with the staff and come up with setbacks that made sense for a solar project. They probably wouldn't have made a lot of sense for a residential project, but that's an example of something specific where a solar zoning regulation is going to be a little bit different than another type of zoning regulation. The other one I'd throw in there that, that is unusual other than in um, renewable energy zoning regulations is decommissioning. You hear a lot more about decommissioning when it comes to wind energy, but uh, it's a factor with solar uh, as well. And if you have good, clear, and, and fair decommissioning regulations in, in your zoning, um, that's a very helpful thing as well. Cliff or Mike, anything? Go ahead. Uh, one thing I would add, I, I, um, one of the big advantages that solar has over wind is that we just don't have the the, the zoning issues, the nimbyism uh, that you have with wind, no one else has to look at it. We can literally hide it behind a bush. Um, and our experience for the most part is uh, people want it out where it can be seen, almost the exact opposite of wind. Um, and once you get to utility scale, there isn't a lot of zoning concerns, you don't have uh, site problems, you don't have a lot of traffic that's created by it, those sorts of things. Uh, one of the things that I think for in communities that are growing communities is to make sure you're not putting it someplace where you want to be later. Uh, don't put it someplace where uh, you want, you're you going to want to build residential housing in, in 10 years because it's going to be there for a while and it's going to look out of place. Put it someplace outside of your growth pattern. And that, to me, is more important than anything else. Um, and that's the real estate developer in me. Um, <laughs> you know, I, we've done a couple of 
we, we did one out in, uh, we're doing one out in Scotts Bluff and I said, I said, no, 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 this isn't the right location. This needs to be a residential neighborhood. And uh, the city looked at the difference in cost between putting their solar there uh, where all the transmission was and putting it someplace else. And they told me to go sit on a stick because that's where they were gonna put it. Uh, and they did it because it saved them half a million dollars. Um, but I think you need to look at that and you need to think where is our city growing, particularly for a city like Lincoln. Well, great points. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, when we purchased, or when we built the one at Capitol Beach, uh, just on the west side of Lincoln, across the high interstate from uh, the uh, airport, uh, we ran into a number. We ended up with about four thousand pages of things to file, uh, but one of them was the uh, airport uh, clearances. We had to make sure that we were clear of that. Uh, the other one was uh, some kind of a particular insect that they found. And then uh, there's the floodplain. And the floodplain was overriding in design, so I ended up finding modules that could be submerged in water. And then we had, uh, I don't know why you'd ever want to do that, but, uh, and then we, <laughs> we ended up putting the inverters on a 10-foot stick, which was kind of interesting too. So, uh, you know, you compromise and you make these compromises, but we are able to put it where no, it could not be used. I mean, as to, to Cliff's point, and that land was of no use, it was just drainage area, and an important function, but when you can actually put solar somewhere where you can't use the land, uh, I think that's a, an added benefit to the whole project. For about residential systems, what are maybe just a couple of key components of building planning commission to worry about residential systems in rural areas, especially the overriding concern is going to be uh, that the area uh, conforms to electrical code, I think, in the building code. So your, your setbacks on your building and your electrical code has to be observed. Uh, I would keep one thing in mind, uh, too, that uh, if there is a fire at the residence or the shop and it's out in the country, uh, there's a great chance that the building will be burnt to the ground by the time the, you know, the fire trucks arrive. And so things that we have today that are really bogging our business down, which are a rapid shutdown where the rooftop has to be shut down, that's, a, that's an area where you have problems with electronics, and it looks like that'll be worked out maybe in the next three to five years. But I think some of our local code officials are uh, relaxing on some of that, and it is within their jurisdiction uh, not to enforce certain characteristics of the code. And I think that is a very prudent choice because one of the things about solar that's really wonderful, and everybody can attest to that, you don't have callbacks on it. You know, once you put it in, it's pretty much done and it's installed. But what I would want to do is, is uh, put installations in where it starts to be problematic for the homeowner or the, the business owner. And, and I think that's one of the overriding criteria that makes sense. The rooftop solar creates some problems in some areas. I mean, we'll just be blunt about it. Um, we, um, I, I'm, I'm a clear believer in solar. Um, and at some point, it's nice to take it off the rooftop and put it on, as a ground mount um, because it, um, it's cheaper, it's easier to fix, it's not in the way when you, when you have to reshingle the roof. Um, but that starts to be a problem because now you have these solar panels that are out there acting like fences and, um, um, and, and it is an issue. And we don't think it's in the community's best interest to try and zone out the, the uh, solar. Um, if you have issues around that, we think it's in your best interest to do a community solar project so you have alternatives because people are going to be putting solar up one way or the other. Um, they're gonna do it for environmental reasons, they're gonna do it for economic reasons, uh, and you're gonna, you're gonna have to, to deal with it. And I think the easiest way to deal with it is provide them with an alternative that you want them to go to. Right. Sir. I was gonna ask Tesla if I could catch him here today and ask him <laughs> that very question. Um, what is the status of solar shingles? Uh, 
we haven't been able to get a hold of them. We've tried uh, and haven't been able to get a hold of them. We have looked at some uh, uh, products from CertainTeed that look pretty good, and CertainTeed is, in fact, a, uh, a shingle company, not a solar company. Mm -hmm. um, they are uh, they're good-looking pro product. I think they make an awful lot of sense. Um, they look good. The, uh, they don't have any uh, wind issues but they were significantly more expensive uh, when we got to the bottom line. And the Tesla shingles are even more so. Uh, when they tell you that it's the same cost as shingles, they're, they're talking about uh, a tiled uh, roof, okay? So it's, uh, it's not what we're used to here. What, if you know, ballpark, what is the difference in cost between a kind of a regular old asphalt shingle roof and a solar shingle roof it was I think the last time I looked at it it was two and a half times yeah mm. but again if you compare it to a tiled roof it makes sense yeah. but, hmm. and Jeff do you remember how much more expensive the certain teed was for our 60 or 80 percent more but I think those things are going to come around I really do. Other questions? Yes. And the question was, any issues with insurance or insurance companies? That really depends on the insurance company. Um, that the first experience that we had was our project in, in Central City, and there were basically eight of us that put up 25 KW systems out there. I called my insurance company, and, and he said $250 a year to insure it. And the next eight panels were owned by the by the veterinarian, and he called his insurance agency, and he said nineteen hundred dollars a year. So his was six times as expensive as mine was. Um, so what we ended up doing was insuring it um, together uh, under one insurance policy and, and splitting it up. So there is a, a big variation with that, um, but on rooftop solar. Uh, most insurance companies have have just absorbed that and 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 fit it in. It really the, the panels last. They're not what's going to be replaced after the hailstorm. The problem is the whole roof's going to be replaced except the shingles underneath the panels. That's the that's what we see over and over again. Covenants, right? So this panel is about zoning, but covenants in a lot of ways are private zoning. Um, how, how big of an issue are covenants for what you guys do? I'm actually going to be very interested in, in supporting legislation in Nebraska <laughs> to join the majority of this country in prohibiting covenants that prohibit solar. Because you line up the parts of town that have the money and disposable income to invest in solar, they're prohibited from doing so because covenants in their neighborhood are legacy covenants based on solar systems like the ugly tank picture I showed you just a few minutes ago. And that thinking is held over from the 1980s that needs to be eliminated. And it's been done in the majority of the states in the union, I think 28 at last count. We need to do that in Nebraska. It was up for a committee last year, didn't get out of committee, but I would appreciate your support as we move forward. And I'm working with the realtors uh, to definitely get rid of this uh, because I've had realtors come to me and say that they've actually had a positive experience with solar on a new home that they just sold. So this is something we need to get rid of on, on the covenants most definitely. I think that happens to be LB621. <laughs> I'm just guessing, but yes, last year. And it may be back this year. It, it's still around, as Mike said, in committee. Uh, may be back uh, this coming session as a new bill with some a little bit of tailoring to try and, and alleviate some concerns. We develop real estate. We wouldn't develop real estate in an area that had covenants against solar. Uh, because to us, it's a restriction that makes it harder to sell the house. Interesting. Okay. So we've got two more minutes. Any last questions out there? The way Ranger develops projects and the way most utility-scale developers develop projects, we do not want to change the, des the zoning designation of the land. So these projects site really well on farmland. Farmers are usually enthusiastic participants and have been here. 
Um, and part of the reason for that is that this land has largely been in their families for generations, over 100 years. Um, and it's ag land. And so, uh, you know, a large part of the work of the kind of permitting and ordinances is to ensure that what goes on that land is a solar project and only a solar project. Um, and that allows also for when the project is done, when it's finished producing power, uh, for it all to come out of the ground. Um, and because of the nature of solar, which is very not impactful on the land, um, you know, the design there is that the, the land should be able to be farmed again at the end of its useful life, if possible. So the way that that's made possible is that it's not rezoned, that it does not turn to commercial or industrial, but that it stays ag. Um, you know, different cities and councils have different ways of, of doing that, um, but, but it's very important that, uh, you know, for these projects to have kind of the low impact that they are intended to have, that uh, the zoning does stay agricultural, um, and that the land basically, um, you know, some states have treated it as a almost like a CRP program where the land lays fallow. You plant local pollinators and grasses that are, uh, you know, are good for the soil for the life of the project. And when it's up, the land should be in at least as good shape, if not better, than when uh, the project went in the ground. It's a great question, though. All right, that'll be the last word. Please join me in thanking these three.